This is a shocking true crime story that can leave you shattered. Our spine-chilling story today is about the rape and murder of two young children at the hands of an evil pedophile. On 31st March 1970, 11-year-old Susan Muriel Blatchford and 12-year-old Gary John Hanlon were lured from an unknown location close to their home in North London into a copse on the outskirts of Epping Forest, where they were raped and murdered by known pedophile Ronald Jebson. Susan and Gary would go on to become known as babes in the wood due to the location of their murders and the subsequent discovery of their bodies and the investigation into their tragic murders would remain unsolved for almost 30 years. Welcome to this channel. Today we'll be taking a look at the tragic and horrifying story of Susan Blatchford and Gary Hanlon, the babes in the wood. Before we continue, do not forget to like, share and subscribe to keep in touch with our latest videos. And now, come along with us as we take a look into the truly tragic story of the babes in the woods. 11-year-old Susan Blatchford left her home in Riley Road, Enfield, North London, around 4.30 p.m. on 31st March 1970 to call at the home of her school friend, 12-year-old Gary Hanlon, who lived nearby. When she arrived, she asked Gary's mother, Beryl, if Gary was at home. Gary soon joined Susan at the front door and asked his mother for permission to join his friend for a walk. His mother agreed upon the promise he would return in one hour for dinner. Little did she know, however, that this would be the last time she would ever see her son alive. Gary and Susan happily walked down Marilyn Avenue hand in hand, with Gary holding his football under one hand. The last verifiable sighting of Gary and Susan was around approximately 5.30 p.m when both of them were seen walking across a nearby field. When Susan and Gary failed to return home, both sets of parents became understandably worried and filed missing person reports at the Ponders End Police Station at approximately 8 p.m. the same evening. The Metropolitan Police launched an intense manhunt the following day to try and locate the children. Chief Superintendent Leonard Reed was in charge of the operation and at the height of the investigation, 600 officers were assigned full-time to the case. Fears for the safety of the children were also heightened by the fact that the weather had fallen below freezing point on the night of their disappearance. During his investigation, Superintendent Reed discovered that Susan was the more confident character of the two. She was also described as a tomboy who enjoyed playing football, climbing trees, and playing with boys' toys. On the other hand, Gary, although described by his family as a plucky boy, was shy in comparison. Gary was the youngest of three siblings, and he had a great love for football, which turned out to be a major factor in his friendship with Susan. Investigators quickly discounted any possibility of the children having run away, as neither of them took any of their personal possessions and began to interview over 15,000 people, including known sex offenders, in an attempt to get to the bottom of the disappearance. Sadly, there were no results even after investigating many potential sightings. Search and rescue dogs were used to scour over 5,000 acres of local fields and woodlands in addition to underwater search and recovery units searching local rivers, canals, reservoirs, and flooded gravel pits. The Daily Mail also published a national front page article on 14 April offering £1,000 for children's safe return. In mid-April, the search for Susan and Gary was extended nationwide, with Scotland Yard becoming active in the manhunt. Sadly, it would take 11 more weeks before the bodies of the children would be found. About 78 days after the disappearance of Susan and Gary, on the evening of 17 June 1970, a young man named Leonard Cook discovered the bodies of Susan and Gary in a bird watcher's hide inside a densely wooded copse. According to Leonard's statement, he had been walking his Labrador dog near the edge of Epping Forest when his dog entered the copse and refused to return. When he entered the copse to search for the dog, he saw the bone-chilling sight of a child's foot inside what appeared to be a hide fashioned from branches and bracken. This copse was less than six walking miles from the children's home and had been searched by police officers and search dogs on 9 April. The children were found lying on their backs, side by side, with Susan's arm placed across Gary's body. Several articles of their clothing, including their underwear, had been removed and their bodies were covered with leaves, twigs and branches. 
the bodies were badly decomposed and pathologist James Cameron could only confirm their identities through dental records. Although some sections of the press speculated the children had died of exposure due to the harsh weather on the night of their disappearance, the clothing of each child pointed to the possibility that they had been redressed after their deaths, leading both sets of parents and several police officers to suspect that Susan and Gary had not died of natural causes. Unfortunately, very little forensic evidence could be obtained due to the extensive decomposition of both bodies. The coroner Charles Clark was unable to determine a cause of death for either child or determine whether they had been the victim of any form of sexual assault. As such, he returned an open verdict on the case and ruled that the missing clothing may have been caused by wild animals. Both sets of parents refused to agree with the ruling with Susan's mother, remarking that the only animal capable of removing her daughter's underwear, tights and bra, but leaving her raincoat and blouse intact, must have been a human male. Although Superintendent Reed attempted to convince his superiors at Scotland Yard that all the known facts of the case indicated the children had been abducted and murdered, he was informed that resources could not continue to be used on a murder case he could not prove have been committed. Sadly, the deaths of Susan and Gary were never classified as a murder investigation, and the case gradually grew cold. Superintendent Reed, who believed the case was a murder, wrote in his final report about the case. Unless somebody surrenders himself or comes into custody and admits this offence, it is most unlikely that it will ever be resolved. And this seemed to be the case for almost 30 years. In May 1996, convicted pedophile and child killer Ronald Jebson contacted Scotland Yard offering information regarding the babes in the Wood Meadows. He claimed at first to have only witnessed the murders and blamed Robert and Maureen Papper, who were the parents of the eight-year-old girl he murdered in 1974, and for whose murder he was serving a term of life imprisonment. His claims were investigated but quickly discounted. Ronald Jebson was born on August 1938 and was adopted as an infant. He was convicted of indecent exposure at age 15 and began actively sexually abusing children shortly thereafter. Ronald was also an alcoholic and amphetamine addict. He enlisted for the British Army in 1960 but had been discharged following a period of being absent without leave. Ronald Jebson would go on to amass a lengthy criminal record for offences ranging from petty theft to rape. Eleven days after the murder of Susan and Gary, Ronald was arrested in Nottingham for sexually abusing an eleven-year-old boy whom he had lured into his car and was sentenced to five years in prison for this offence. He was released in 1973 and subsequently moved in with his former school friend, Robert Papper, hiding the truth behind his criminal convictions for child molestation from the family. Ronald left the family in the spring of 1974 following an argument arising from Maureen Papper's unease with the way Ronald behaved around their six children, especially eight-year-old Rosemary Hahn. Robert Papper said his wife discreetly informed him, saying, I don't like him. There's just something about him I just don't like. Ronald did not take having to leave the Papper's household well and was reported to have told the Papers, I'll do something you'll regret. I'll get even, as he left their household. Not long after this, Ronald lured Rosemary from her school to a field where he sexually assaulted her before strangling her with a piece of twine as he again raped her. He was arrested the following day and he readily admitted to the murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Rosemary Ann with a recommendation to serve a minimum of 20 years. On 24 August 1988, two years after he initially contacted authorities, Ronald contacted the Edmonton police station and expressed his wish to formally confess to the babes in the Wood Meadows. He confessed to luring the children into his vehicle where he plied them with alcohol and cannabis as he drove them to the edge of Epping Forest where he had already constructed a hide with willow branches. Once inside the copse, Ronald claimed his aggressive nature emerged although, to his frustration, both Susan and Gary resisted his initial efforts to sexually interfere with them. He then violently sexually assaulted Susan and strangled her with Gary watching. The brave 12-year-old Gary tried to fight Ronald, who struck him in the face and then rayed him as he strangled him. He remained with the bodies until the early hours of the morning before returning home taking Susan's underwear as a keepsake. On 28 March 2000, 
Ronald appeared at Brent Magistrates Court to be formally charged with the babes in the Wood Meadows. He pleaded guilty to both murders and was sentenced to two further terms of life imprisonment to be served concurrently with his existing life sentence following a 90-minute hearing. Judge David Stokes branded Ronald a wicked and perverted individual, adding, 30 years ago you abducted, sexually assaulted and murdered two young children. What these children went through before they died does not bear thinking about. The only point that can be made on your part is that you have owned up to what you did, which caused a small degree of comfort to their close relatives who are here to see justice done. Ronald Jebson was never paroled from his life sentences and he spent more than 40 years in prison. He died of kidney failure at the University Hospital of North Durham on 17 April 2015 at the age of 76, having signed an order instructing medical personnel that he not be resuscitated. He died alone had no friends or family, and informed staff he had no contacts whom he wished to be informed of his death, which is perhaps a fitting end for a man who caused several families so much pain and suffering. Thanks for watching. Feel free to share your thoughts on this case in the comments. And please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe if you found this video enjoyable. See you in the next video.